رحم الله من قرا الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم sorry brothers and sisters there's a honda jazz hb jl 900 sorry BJL900, please, we need that car removed quickly. BJL900, please, we need that car removed quickly. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahi ar-Rahmanir rahim الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته ما بعد أعظم الله وجورنا وجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم continuing from the brief introduction we had yesterday the prophet of Islam he came to this world like those prophets that went before him and they emphasized that the human being is within a system that is purposeful and that at an individual level, the human beings need to acquire that sense of purpose in order to lead a meaningful, fulfilled life, a life that is truly meaningful. Today, despite my Islam, despite my worship, when I ask myself, is my life a meaningful life? Is it a worthy life? Is it a life that is truly termed as living? Am I truly gaining, becoming? Am I grounded? Is there solidity in my being? The answer is no, unfortunately. It is like a person who is lost, bewildered within the land. A person who has held to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means of comfort, as a means of reassurance, but there is no proper rooting or grounding within me. I am as scattered as anything can be, totally dissipated, as the verse of the Quran states, like those who the shaitan have caused to become bewildered within the land, totally scattered from within. I am always fighting to hold my world together. Yet, the odd thing is, I can't live without a sense of meaning, without a sense of purpose. And look at what this does to me. First and foremost, I am unable to open my eyes to the real world and acknowledge the world as it is. How wonderful were those people, those beautiful souls, about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, وَالَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ Allah. And those people who remember Allah Qiyaman wa Quhuda, when they stand, when they sit on their sides, on their backs, and at once they find this cognition, this recognition, this understanding, and they exclaimed, Rabbana, ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhanak. O Lord, you have not created any of this in vain. Glory be to you. And the word subhan and glory, it must be emphasized is the very act through which the angels proclaimed supremacy over Adam. We proclaim your glory. What the angels were saying here, 
to Allah was that we hold you free of every defect and these souls who are then touched with the truth they immediately inadvertently proclaim and this cry is from the core of their being at that recognition of what is happening they immediately proclaim subhanaka glory be to you there is no fault here in this system it's something quite grand quite profound quite beautiful quite magnificent but here i am despite having the heritage of islam despite having god i feel as scattered as the dust or the dried leaves that are blown within tremendous winds i feel as scattered as that there is nothing in me there is no stable substance that can give me that reassurance that yes i stand here firmly this is life i'm leading a meaningful life however despite that i am forced to impose meaning on life because i can't exist in isolation of purpose or in isolation of a meaning and think about this feebleness of our situation i was in makkah this year and of course gave lengthy talks on the whole act and the spirituality of the kaaba and sai it was at that point that i realized that as a human being there is a need within us to impose meaning and hence we have to bring out meaning that the kaaba signifies this the rotation around the kaaba signifies so such and such the sai signifies this and that we have to impose meaning but never once have i gone on my knees in submission in humility and say truly o oh lord i do not understand i really do not understand how can that cry emerge from the core of me subhanaka or that cry rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila how can that cry emerge truly from within me until the moment that i open my eyes to the truth and acknowledge that i really truly do not understand when always my presumption is this the framework in which i work is this that everything does make sense and i'm forced to make sense of it i am as lost and as bewildered as a child without its parents and i have to construct meaning and that meaning is as feeble as i am think about it allah jalla jalaluhu has not created this massive mammoth creation look at this creation of god look at the stars look at the galaxies my goodness unending beauty allah khalaqun alim allah is the infinite creator the infinite knower and look at this world my goodness from that sun that's burning from that moon which is a darkened place to this colorful scheme look at this look at this carpet look at the tapestry look at the way the threads are interwoven look at the subtleties of it all look at this solid substance look at that soft substance look at the beautiful array of colors and the way in which they have come together look at the crawling insects hear the sound of life around us at that point if we can open truly open to the truth we will understand that the truth is so much beyond the little worlds that we have carved out within our minds and the world in which we have become so complacent allahu akbar for somebody who has the wilaya of ali ibn abi talib that is a person who by the gesture of a finger can cause the sun to dance in mid heaven this is how heavy the wilaya of ali ibn abi talib is but for me this wilaya is restricted to the proclamation of wilaya but the truth is that his wilaya permeates the totality of existence but if only we were to awaken to the truth as the truth is within itself how odd that a human being who is not even rep whose world earth is not even represented by a dot do we know this that on the milky way the earth is not even a little dot this human being 7 billion of them whose full world is not even depicted by a dot feels within himself that he is the be all and end all of existence and creation my goodness allah says in the quran tell them that what we have created far exceeds their world forget their own existence 
There is a tremendous story here. There is a secret here. It is there for those who open their eyes and care to view. For those who truly say, O oh Lord, disclose to me what is happening. But this cannot happen. For we are so complacent in our state. And two, we are so scattered. We are so scattered within ourselves. The same thing that humanity has been doing since Adam, we are reenacting the same things. On many occasions, we have replaced the symbols of old with new symbols, but yet with the same ethos and the same meaning. By Allah, if it is not audacious, then let me say this, that we have replaced an idol with Allah, and that Allah represents the same idol that at one point we used to worship in our naivety. Again, now in intellectual naivety, we do the same thing. Yet within us is the true cry of God that open up and receive the truth as it is. When we truly open our minds and eyes, or to work on this theme a little, we will see that whether we like it or not, there is a grand purpose going on here in this world. Whether we awaken, it, awaken to it or not, we are forced to follow a purpose. The whole of this humanity that is here right now is a great phenomena whether they acknowledge this or not they are a part of a greater purpose but the problem is that we see ourselves as detached from the whole it is like a person who is performing a strategical role in a group of people who are all designated to perform their own roles but he suffers a momentary bout of amnesia in that state of amnesia, now he is asking, what is my role here and what is my purpose? He can never fully comprehend or understand his own being or his sense of purpose unless he begins to re recollect and remember his state before amnesia, that he is a part of a whole and his purpose is intertwined with the purpose of the whole as the whole. This is how me and you have become. We feel we are isolated instances. And we have a purpose that we are fulfilling. And hence we have to carve out a purpose. Little do we know that my God, we are a product of this earth. This earth is a product of stellar dust. The whole of this universe is a product of something else. And all of it is enjoying a beautiful unity. It's all together. I am intertwined in this system. Inextricably connected within it. I am not an individual. I am humanity at large. I am not one person. My purpose is intertwined with seven billion souls that are here right now. And with the souls that have come from Adam till the souls that will come till the end. And before Adam, whatever preceded Adam, I am as connected with it all as the strands of this carpet are connected with each other. And then humanity is connected with this earth and the earth with the solar system and the solar system with the galaxy and whatever and however amount and many amounts of worlds that Allah might have created. At that point when we awaken, my goodness, it is a different feeling altogether. What did the prophet do? He saw this state, but there is a need for human beings to awaken and to realize what they are and who they are. Otherwise, Mother Nature would not have produced its finest crop, the prophets of God, the Imams. There is a need within humanity that humanity should awaken at, in the, at an individual level and at a collective level. And hence, we have had these magnificent people who have actually come and prodded us and caused us to awaken slightly. When the prophet came, what did he see? He saw this scattered state of humanity, totally scattered. People who had to construct meanings because it's a need of humanity. So they constructed these gods who then became a source of purpose for their existences. But yet within themselves, they were not grounded at all. You know, when we read the verses of the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, or like, the storm from the sky in which there is thunderclaps and lightning. They place their fingers in their ears for the fear of the thunder. And whenever the lightning strikes, 
They walk therein even though it blinds them. These are parables of me and of you. This at a psychological level is talking about my state. This is how I am within myself. Totally scattered, totally lost. There is total fear. I plug my ears. The blinding takes my sight away. The, the lightning takes my sight away. But even then, I'm forced to walk in that lightning because after that, there is nothing but darkness. And then Allah states, or like the one who kindles a fire, in order to illuminate that which is around him, because we only find control once we can observe things. But as soon as that which is lit around him, Allah takes away his inner light and leaves him to wander off in darkness and blindness. This is depicting most accurately my own state. It's not talking about any kafir. It's talking about me and it's my human condition. Every time I put light and construct a meaning to this world, the inner light is taken away because it's a feeble meaning. It's a feeble meaning because I haven't awoken to the truth. I don't know how to awaken to the truth. The Prophet saw this state. Now, before we go there, let's go back, revisit the Kaaba story just for a moment and we come to what the Prophet did. Around the Kaaba, we go around it, yes? My goodness, does it make sense to any thinking being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking us from four corners of the world? I know the world doesn't have corners because sometimes people object. So how did you use that phrase, four corners of the world? But you know what I mean. I remember once we were listening to an uh, Ali Medin and he was taking us through Qiyamat, yes? And he was saying, look, Allah will ask. And we were crying, sobbing our hearts out until he said, and you will be in that one corner. And God will ask him, he said, wait a minute, there are no corners on the day of Qiyamah. And it spoiled the whole journey, mental journey. So it was just on a side note. In any case, people are led from different parts of the world towards that place to rotate anti-clockwise. Tell me, for a minute, just pause. There is no spiritual meaning there. There is a spiritual meaning, but not like the one that we are understanding. There is a social meaning, yes, we can see it. The collective body coming together and the identity of the society, the greater meaning is there. The greater human being exists there in full unity of humanity. We can see that. But the spiritual meanings that we impose on that Kaaba and circuiting around it are really and truly constructs of our own minds because we need to make it meaningful. Why can we not say that maybe there is a cosmic meaning there that I'm still not understanding. Maybe it's something to do with the stellar constellations. Maybe it's all about, as Allah says, that heavens will open and they will become doorways and passages. Maybe we are functioning in a way in which we are consistent with the rest of the universe. But that meaning will never come to our mind. And even if it does, there's no finality to that meaning. However, what I'm trying to say here is that the meaning and the purpose that we place upon life is as feeble and as weak as we are within ourselves. We need to find meaning as a human condition, yet the meanings that we are finding are counterproductive. There are two levels of crisis within us. Let's go back to that story and then we go on with what the Prophet has done. We know that story, and we've all heard it, and I've repeated it on many occasions. We are like those people who are faced with an object within a dark room. We are sent in to examine that object. Now, as a human condition of ours, whatever little information we have, through that little information, we have to construct the meaning of the whole. Yes? So, A arrives at a particular portion of that object, feels it because it's dark, and comes out and says, it's a hose pipe. B arrives at another portion of the object and says, no, it's a brew. Third one comes and says, no, it's a hand fan. The fourth one comes out and says, no, it's a pillar. The problem here is that all of them, in accordance with their limited statuses, have constructed a meaning in accordance with what they understood. And they constructed the meaning of the whole. None of them thought that I only had access to a portion of the object. 
and maybe I am right in one part and the other one is right in the other part. No. Immediately all of them concluded from examining their small portion that the whole was as they examined the portion. Can you see that? Two, what they did after that was they began to swear that what they knew was the absolute truth. Three, they began to kill each other in accordance with the truth that they knew. This is my story and this is your story on the face of this earth. This is me and you. I am saying this is the truth. You are saying something else is the truth. We are so stuck in this limitedness of limited truth that we are constructing the whole truth around our limited accessible understanding. And then we are ready to die and kill for it. And we have the audacity to say that Allah is mine, not yours. And I'll go to paradise, not you. This is the audacity that we have. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Look at the state of the human being today. Allahu Akbar. When Salman Farsi was faced with the verses that indeed those who believe shall inherit God's pleasure and those who do not believe shall inherit his damnation, he began to weep. When he wept, the Prophet said, why? He said, at the fate of my Christian brothers, as soon as he said that, the verse was revealed. Indeed, those who believe, the Yahud, the Nasara, the Sabians, Allah is putting all these categories on the same pedestal and saying, whoever among these four, whoever among these four believes in Allah, the final day, does righteous deeds, then they shall have their reward. But a Muslim before that was ready to fight a Christian to proclaim his own truth and say to the Christian, you're damned in hell and I'm going to paradise. Whereas there Allah reveals, all of you will go to paradise provided you all function at the level of proper humanity. Look at the way in which the truth is and the way in which we are. What did the Prophet do? The Prophet went to his community. He saw them extremely scattered, extremely bewildered. People who are performing the purpose inadvertently. People who are arriving at the purpose, the universal purpose. To be honest with you, my dear brothers and sisters, to be very honest with you, people will go to paradise and even then they will not understand the meaning of the purpose. My goodness, it is only those very few souls who have awoken in this world who will find the true pleasure of purpose. Even they will be limited in the way they comprehend it. Let's recount that hadith, and I want to repeat it in Urdu again if I remember, that the Prophet is told in the hadith of Mi'raj, O oh Muhammad, there is a pure soul in the world. When its time terminates, I take it to myself within the blinking of an eye. The soul appears in front of me and I say, O oh soul, Inform me of the ongoings of the world that you have just parted from. The soul trembles and says to me, O Lord, I swear by your might and your glory. I know not of your world. From the time that you have created me and the time that I have awoken to you, I have done nothing but tremble in your awe or the awe of your majesty. Allah will say, indeed, you have spoken the truth. And I swear by my might and my majesty that I shall keep you in a place where there is no veil between me or you, between me and you. What is the veil? The veil is this paradise of God, the heaven. It appears that people will be going to paradise and will still be unaware of what has gone on and what is going on. Allahu Akbar. Allah says in the Quran, Waladayna Mazid, and we have more to give. Even after giving paradise, Allah is saying, Waladayna Mazid, and we have more to give. If only we could awaken to that and what the Prophet and his family are saying about this. Now, when the Prophet came, he saw souls like us, extremely scattered. What he did was he brought in that beautiful factor that permeates the whole of existence, the universe that we know and the universe we do not know. For Allah is khalaqun alim. 
He has the keys to the unseen. Who knows how much unseen there is? Even the Prophet does not know those unseen names, the names that Allah has not disclosed. The greatest depiction of the beauty of Allah Himself is submitting in front of Allah in humility and saying, I ask you for the sake of those names that you have not disclosed, that you have concealed within your essence. How much unseen there is. In any case, Allah, the Prophet of Allah, brings that principle of wahdaniya. And he gives it very simply to his community. That community, once it abides by that principle of wahdaniya that permeates the existence at large, whether physical, spiritual, psychological, moral, whichever way you look at it, it's the principle of wahdaniya that prevails everywhere. There is nothing but unity wherever you look. Once they upheld the principle of wahdaniya, they were released from the scatteredness. They were gathered, they were focused, and they began to grow, to germinate, to sprout, and move on like beautiful trees, attaining their purpose. And some of them arrived at the notion of what was truly going on. Tell me now, I'll ask a question, I pose this question somewhere else. Who likes slimy slugs? Does anybody like slugs? Especially when they're on your doorstep? Well, in, in the UK, we have a big problem. There are slugs everywhere. And then inadvertently, you step on one. And of course, it makes a mess. Now, how much is that slug worth? How much is it worth? Is it worth buying? Be honest, is it worth buying? Is it worth looking at? It's not even worth a glance. I'm just talking about how we are. It's not even worth a glance. Yes, it's worth talking about if it leads to entertaining discussion. If it keeps your attention to me and focus to me, then it's worth talking about. Yes? But otherwise, that slug has no worth. True? On the other hand, the Kohinoor, the diamond that the queen possesses in her crown, the Kohinoor that was looted from India, then they should return it to India because they did not go and rule over India through their armed forces. They went and colonized through very deceptive means. By all means, it should go back to India. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the Indians. At this point, I'm a British. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the beauty of being brown and being British at the same time. You can have two states to live in. But truly, I believe in a human state, so I'm as Australian as you are, and as Pakistani as the Pakistanis, so I get away by supporting any cricket team whenever they play. <laughs> now, what is the Kohinoor worth? It is worth beyond description. It's beauty. The aesthetic appeal, the money, the weight, the way it's carved. Compare a slug to the Kohinoor. The slug doesn't stand a chance. Forget the slug, I don't stand a chance in front of the Kohinoor. Now, let us go somewhere else. Let us go to Mars. We send a probe to Mars, and guess what? It finds that slimy, ugly slug on Mars. Now, that slug on Mars is brought back onto this Earth. The queen says, I want to buy this slug with my Kohinoor. We will say, queen, even if you give Philip in return for this slug, we will not give it to you. <laughs> it's the greatest discovery of mankind that there is life in the universe. There is other forms of life in this universe. It is the most valuable thing ever. It's worth more than the treasures of this world. That little, ugly, slimy slug. But... In this world, I have never appreciated that slug. I have never appreciated it. But you take it out of its context and place it on Mars, my goodness, it becomes the greatest discovery. It dwarfs Einstein's theory of relativity and splitting of the atom all together. It makes them all, renders them meaningless. There is another universe out there, a living universe, through that little slug that is not worth anything, which is now worth more than the findings of humankind from the time of Adam till now. This is our state of scatteredness. 
we are not present at all how can a being that is so scattered ever have a sense of true purpose and ever know what is going on truly even if a philosopher were to explain to us purpose intellectually it does not make sense at this level I need to feel it from within me it needs to come from the core of me it's not an intellectual comprehensible comprehensible thing when we explain things we can't even explain them properly think about it the language that I'm talking and what you are understanding are two different things now you must be thinking what's gotten into him right now maybe he didn't have his fresh air think about this when I talk about things even though it's in the same language of communication do you really understand what I'm saying you are only understanding the way in which you relate to what I'm saying when I say the carpet is green it is only because we have agreed to call a certain property green but what I am seeing may not be what you are seeing I could be seeing something totally different and you could be seeing something totally different so when I say green even at the level of description to you it only makes sense in accordance with the way you relate to it now when I say green is beautiful it's an alien language altogether it's an alien language altogether because the meaning of beautiful ugly love hate these are all very subjective things and can never truly be conveyed by language what we have done is we have agreed to accept certain terms broadly broad meanings of certain terms and we talk so even at the level of discussion we can never truly convey to each other what we are meaning and that is why we say whatever the Quran says we can't understand its intensity we can't understand its intensity I never for once can believe that the merciful God can create hell. He can't. Hell is my construct. I have created it. Remember that beautiful story when Bahlul met with the Khalifa and the Khalifa said, Bahlul, from whence do you come? He said, from the pit of hell. He said, oh, was it hot? He said, actually, there was no fire therein. He said, how is that possible? He said, well, I asked the same thing to the keeper of hell. I said, why is there no fire? He said, Bahlul, there is no fire in hell you will bring your own fire with you the merciful Lord can never create hell I am the creator of hell this is the living hell in which I am in myself not this whole yes what I'm saying here is that the meanings cannot even be comprehended so now if anybody gives us a sense of purpose it's as alien as anything could be purpose has to come from within we have to feel that beautiful purpose to make life meaningful what did the prophet do he reduced this distraction by giving a point of focus a point of focus a point of convergence a point of direction and he said that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it liberated those souls not only did it liberate them from false social economical systems it truly liberated them from within and as it liberated them from within and as they were able to converge and focus from within themselves the purpose began to reveal itself when they became one with the beautiful whole and began to understand that no something phenomenal is going on the scientists and medics in the 70s they were saying the appendix is a useless organ but an Arif will always say subhanak ma khalaqta hadha batil you have not created anything in vain everything has a beautiful function and at that point their lives became so meaningful so fruitful not only was there intellectual growth but there was true human moral growth from within themselves imagine from where to where just giving an example here and I don't want to overstep my uh, time uh, Abu Lahab was it or Abu Jahal Abu Lahab he had a slave who was freed who then became a Muslim who then faced him in battle in Badr I believe 
the slave overcame Abu Lahab. When the slave sat on the chest of Abu Lahab about to sever his head, Abu Lahab looked at him. Now at that point, think about it. Abu Lahab is a materialist. Yes, he believes in materialism and God that promote materialistic values. At that point, the light switch is about to be switched off. Yes, everything that he knows is going to go now. This is the final point. What should be preoccupying him at this point? What should be of paramount importance for me and you? Obviously, we will cry out, Ya Allah. We will cry out, Ya Hussein. If I want to go, I want to go in the name of my beloved. Let my spirit be seized in the name of Hussein. What is happening to Abu Lahab? He says to his slave, he says, if you are going to kill me, then I will want you to ask a free man to come and get my head, not you, for you are my slave. I will ask him, what difference does it make? Who cuts your head? The fact is that your head is going to be cut. The slave said, no, I shall sever your head. He said, then in that case, my second request is that you throw your sword and cut my head with my sword, for it is a prestigious sword. Think about this. These are things to think about. We are like this. The slave said, no, I'll cut it with my sword, which is very cheap. He said, then my third request is that you cut my head from my shoulders so that my head looks glorious on top of a spear, not from the chin. He said, I'll cut it from the chin. But think about what was happening in Abu Lahab's mind. Think about where he was. He was at that point of conceit that even after that, that ego, that scatteredness prevails to the utmost. Whereas the community that abided by Tawheed, and we want to explain this function of Tawheed in every way that we can conceive it in the next few days. Whilst those who abided by Tawheed, subhanallah, the people who used to kill each other before the Prophet came, for the mere reason that one's horse preceded the other one in drinking from a watering place. And they would have endless vendettas. These very people who had been totally deprived of humanity in any sense of righteousness, these very people look at them now. One falls within the battlefield. The water bearer rushes to him in order to quench his thirst. And maybe, maybe, save his life he says no there is another ahead of me he is in more need of this water than i am i would tell him drink this water a sip of water will not consume any time but the sense of altruism that he has through allah the sense of love that he has the sense of belonging the sense of purpose the sense of growth the sense of beauty that prevails within this dying man's chest he is dying out of thirst Yet he prefers the thirst. He prefers the thirst over cutting short his brother's rights. There is so much love within him. There is so much tranquility. There is so much peace. There is so much sense of purpose that he says, no, go to the other one. And he prefers the other. And that preference of the other is sweeter than quenching his thirst. The man comes to the other one. He says, no, there is yet another ahead of me. The man goes to the third one. These are the very barbarians of yesterday. The people who did not know anything more than bloodshed. The people who are totally scattered. The people who worshipped endless amounts of gods. The people who are totally insecure. The people who clinched on to life by killing others. Look at what has happened to them. Look at the way in which they have understood what the Prophet was telling them. Look at the way in which they have embodied that core of Tawheed from within their core. He goes to the third one. The third one sends him to the first. He rushes to the first. The first one has died. Advances to the second. The second has died. Goes to the third. The third has lost his life. What has happened here? On the one hand, you have Abu Lahab. On the other hand, you have these noble esteemed sahaba on the highest pedestal of human existence look at what they have understood 
Look at how meaningful their lives have become. Look at how glorious their souls have become. Even though they may not have grasped the wholeness of the whole, but at least they had set off on that journey. In our feeble minds, we feel that there's an objective that we have to attain, yes? How nonsensical is this? The objective is in the making. The beauty is within this journey. There is nothing but a journey. When this phase of journey finishes, another phase of journey begins. Even in paradise, there is nothing but ongoing journey. Blessed is the soul who sets out on the voyage and journeys and is not satisfied at any point of his journey. Even in seventh paradise, the blessed is the one who yearns Allah and says, Oh Allah, you have mazid granted to me. And that mazid is not the brides of paradise, nor the gardens, nor the flowing rivers. It is Allah Jalla Jalaluhu himself. The greatest reward is Allah. Nothing less than Allah shall do. The most blessed is one who sets off on this journey. The journey is the truth. There is no God there to be found if he cannot be found here. Allahu Akbar. We are constructing our meaning as we go along. And if we set off on this journey beautifully, the meaning becomes beautiful. Look at the meanings these wonderful souls have constructed for themselves. Allahu Akbar. I will say this. Forgive me if it's audacious. The purpose as Zainab bin Ali Salamullah Aliha had prior to Karbala and martyrdom of Imam Hussein is very different to the one she had subsequent to it. On the night of Ashura, you see a weakened sister who collapses at the thought of the death of her brother. You remember the incident. She cries unendingly. Her grief is incessant. She falls at the feet of Hussein. She is weakened in her love for Hussein. Yet, she arrives at a body that is decapitated. The head is torn away from it. Every bone is crushed. There is nothing left intact. This is the same one for whom you gave your own and Muhammad or Zainab. Observe him now. View her state. She arrives with her hands tied behind her back. She falls at, her, at his body. She observes the state. She raises her head towards the heavens and says, Allahumma taqabbal minna had al-qurban. O oh Allah, accept this offering from us. From where to where? That was her journey. That was her beautiful meaning. As the face of her broad brother was being poked away, and Ibn Ziyad said, O oh Zainab, how did you find the decree of Allah with regard to your brother? She said, Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I have not seen anything but beauty prevail. What meaning was she living? What purpose was she enjoying? Where was she? There's a narration that a person from Sham wished to behold how the king of kings prepares his departure from Medina. He narrates, I arrived at the Muhalla Bani Hashim, the area where the Hashimites were located. I saw, he says, Hussein on a chair, on a plain ground, around him, were the sons of Hashim, revolving around him as planets revolve around the sun or moths around the eternal flame. At that point, there was a cry, O sons of Hashim, lower your gazes. As they lowered their gazes, I saw a most beautiful, youthful person who resembled the beauty of the prophets of God emerge. With him was a lady covered from head to toe. He brought her to the canopy of the camel. He knelt down and she ascended. I asked who was he and who was she? I was told that was Akbar, the son of Hussein, and that was his mother. Another cry was sounded, O sons of Hashim, lower your gazes and lift them not. At that point, I saw a figure whose majesty resembled the majesty of kings and emperors. He had a mole on his cheek. With him were two women. I could not behold his majesty without trembling from within. He came to the canopy. He knelt. 
and the two women ascended within the canopy of the camel. And as they ascended, two children were placed within their laps. I asked, who was this? Who was he? And who were they? I was told this was Kamar Bani Hashim Abbas. And these were his sisters, Zainab and Umm Kulthum. And those were the young children of Hussein, Sakina, and Akhtasra. We hear from the Zakirin that as the sister of Asgar came to Hussein, and she said, let me behold my infant brother for a moment. She took Asgar into her arms as the time for departure came. Give your brother away to his mother, O child. Call the child, O mother, she said. The mother calls for her baby, but Asgar leaves her not. Did Sugra say into his ears, O Asgar, I do not have anyone but you? Asgar refuses to go. It is said at that point by the Zakirin that Hussein was informed of what was happening. Imam Hussein came. And he whispered into the ear of Asgar, and the child leapt into the arms of its mother. We will say, O oh, Hussein, what did you say? Did you say to Asgar, O oh, Asgar, if you remain behind, then who shall bear the bloodthirsty arrow of Hormala before my final offering? Salawat. Chandek <laughs> minute. اسی موضوع پر بات کریں گے جو کل چھیڑا تھا دعا کا موضوع وہ چند ایک بنیادی باتیں کرنی ہے اور اصول پر باتیں کرنا ہے سب سے پہلا اصول تو یہ ہے کہ جب ہم دعا کرتے ہیں تو ایک رشتہ قائم ہوتا ہے ہمارے اور خدا کے درمیان خدا اور ہمارے درمیان نہ چاہتے ہوئے بھی رشتہ ہے اور وہ رشتہ ٹوٹ بھی نہیں ٹوٹ ہی نہیں سکتا کبھی بھی خدا سے مفر ہی نہیں کوئی ایسی جگہ ہی نہیں کہ جہاں ہم بھاگ سکیں جہاں خدا نہ ہو خدا سے بھاگتے ہوئے بھی خدا کے نزدیک پہنچنا ہے لیکن یہ رشتہ جو قائم ہوتا ہے وہ شعوری رشتہ ہے چونکہ دعا ایک قلبی عمل ہے اور فعل قلبی ہے شعوری فعل ہے کہ جس میں دعا کرنے والا جاگتا ہے بیدار ہوتا ہے یہ اعتراف کرتا ہے کہ میرا پروردگار ہے اور میں اس پروردگار کا بندہ ہوں اور پھر التجا کرتا ہے پروردگار کی طرف اور دعا کا اصل مقصد یہ ہے دل سے جو آہ نکلتی ہے خدا کو پہچاننے کے بعد جو آہ نکلتی ہے اس کا مطلب ہے دعا اور حقیقت میں تو یہ بات ہے کہ دعا کرنے سے پہلے ہی قبول ہو جاتی ہے اللہ اکبر ذرا سوچے خدا نے کہا ہے وہ دعونی استجب لکم مجھ سے مجھے پکاروں میں جواب دوں گا یہ بات نازیب ہے خدا کو شائستگی نہیں دیتی کہ ایک طرف وعدہ کرے خدا اور دوسری طرف وعدے کو پورا نہ کرے اتنی عزت تو ہم میں بھی ہے کہ اگر کسی کو وعدہ دے تو پورا اتریں گے اور یہاں خدا کی بات ہو رہی ہے اللہ اکبر اگر مانگنا ہے خدا سے اے بندے تو کیوں چھوٹی چھوٹی چیزوں پر اکتفا کر لیتا ہے خدا سے اگر پوری کائنات بھی مانگ لی جائے تو کم ہے خدا پوری کائنات بھی دے دے تو گویا خدا نے کچھ نہیں دیا حسین ابن علی کس طرح سے معرفت دلاتے ہیں خدا کی جب کہتے ہیں اللہ تو کیسا اللہ ہے کس طرح تیری توصیف کروں کس طرح تیری مدا کرو تو تو وہ اللہ ہے کہ جو مانگنے سے پہلے عطا کرتا ہے عطا کرنے کے بعد بطور قرضہ مجھ سے مانگتا ہے جھوٹے دل سے میں دیتا ہوں مسکراتا ہوا اپنا لیتا ہے دس گنا اضافہ کر کے دوبارہ مجھی کو دے دیتا ہے خدا سے رشتہ اور شعوری رشتہ قائم کرنے کی بات ہے دعا اور دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ دعا راز توحید ہے کیوں شرک کا مطلب کیا ہے ماں سی و اللہ پر بھروسہ کرنا شرک کا مطلب ہی یہ ہے کہ ماں سی اللہ پر بھروسہ کرنا چاہے وہ بت کی شکل میں ہو یا کسی اور شکل میں ہو بلکہ یہ انگوٹھی پہننا اور یہ گمان کرنا کہ اس انگوٹھی میں تاثیر ہے یہ شرک سے کم نہیں یہ گمان کرنا کہ ڈاکٹر کے پاس میں جاؤں گا اور ڈاکٹر دواؤں کے ساتھ مجھے شفا دے گا یہ شرک سے کم نہیں 
यह गुमान करना कि मैं काम पर जाऊंगा और काम पे जाने के बाद मैं अपना रिस्क हासिल करूंगा किसी के हाथ से खुदा के अलावा यह शिरक है और रसूल खुदा ने इसी बारे में कहा था कि आखिर दिनों में उम्मत में शिरक इस तरह फैल जाएगी कि कोई समझ ही नहीं सकेगा जिस तरह चूंटी एक पत्थर पर काली रात को चलती है और कोई पहचान नहीं सकता इसी तरह शिरक फैल जाएगा मेरी उम्मत में यह सब मसादी के शिरक है दुआ दुआ का असल है तो क्यों क्योंकि मांगने वाला यह एतराफ करता है कि मैं फाकिद हूं और खुदा ही वाजिद है और फिकदान के जरिए से खुदा की रबूबियत का एतराफ करते हैं हम और इसी को कहते हैं तो ही दरअसल दुआ का सबसे पहला बुनियाद सबसे पहली बुनियाद यह है कि दुआ एक रिश्ता है जिसमें शूरी तौर पर हम खुदा को एक्नोलेज करते हैं और एतराफ करते हैं खुदा का और जब लोग पूछते हैं कि खुदा के दलाइल क्या है कौन से प्रूफ हैं बुरहान कौन सा है कि जो हम इकामा कर सकते हैं खुदा के वजूद पर फिलोसफ फलसफी फलसफी बराहीन और इस्तलाल मैं कहूंगा ये सब गलत है कोई भी फलसफी बुरहान साबित नहीं कर सकता वजूद खुदाबंदी का क्यों क्योंकि ऐसा खुदा के जिसकी हम परस्तिस करते हैं वो उस खुदा का वजूद ही नहीं वो तो एक तस्वुर है कि जिसकी इबादत हम कर रहे हैं ऐसा खुदा न कभी था न कभी है न कभी होगा सच्चा खुदा तो वो है जो है जिसको साबित करने की इजाजत ही नहीं है जिसको साबित करने की जरूरत ही नहीं पड़ती उसी तरह के मैं कहता हूं कि मैं हूं खुदा है आप देखें सबसे बड़ी दलील इस बात खुदाबंदी पर यही कलबी दलील है और इसी दलील के बारे में अली नबी तालीब अपने मुनाजात में फरमाते हैं मुनाजत मुतकीन और अपने फकर को जरिया बनाते हैं खुदा की मारिफत का कहते हैं अंतल मौला व अनल आब्द फल यर हमिल आब्द अलमौला तू आका है मैं बंदा हूं और बंदे पर आका के अलावा कौन तर्स खाएगा रहम करेगा अपने फकर को जरिया बनाते हैं खुदा तक पहुंचने का इसमें एतराफ है मेरे फिकदान का और खुदा के विजदान का मैं गुमराह हूं तू हिदायत करने वाला है मैं मरजूक हूं तू राजिक है मैं मैयत हूं तू हई है और जिंदगी देने वाला हर आन फकर के जरिए से खुदा के साथ रिश्ता कायम करते हैं इसलिए कहते हैं दुआ बुनियाद तो है लेकिन शूरी तौर पर दुआ की जाए रट्टी हुई दुआ ना हो अलबत् ये बात हम बाद में करेंगे जो दिन आने वाले हैं दुआएं जो हम पढ़ते हैं वो बिल्कुल रट्टी हुए दुआएं पढ़ते हैं उस बेहद समझे हो दुआ तो हमारा हक है कि हम परवर दिगार से मांगे अगर अल्लाह से नहीं मांगे तो किससे मांगेंगे ए अल्लाह मैं जैसा भी हूं जो भी हूं तेरा हूं आखिर जितना भी गुनेगार हूं जितना भी बदबक्त हूं मेरे पास तेरे इलावा कौन है किसके पास जाऊंगा मैं अगर तेरे पास ना आया तो लेकिन देखे कितना बड़ा अफसोस है हमारी जहनीत पर कि खुदा कहता है उदो ओ नी अस्तजिब लको मुझे पुकारो मैं जवाब दूंगा खुदा कहता है मुझे पुकारो खुदा ये नहीं कहता है मुझसे चीजें मांगो मैं कहता हूं या अल्लाह मुझे एक महल दे दे गाड़ी दे दे बीवी बच्चे दे दे खुदा कहेगा पूरी दुनिया तेरे ही लिए तो है खुदा कहता है खलक तुल खल कल इबन आदम व खलक तुबन आदम नफसी पूरी कायनात इबन आदम के लिए मैंने खल की लेकिन इबन आदम को मैंने अपने आप के लिए खल किया अगर तुम ना भी मांगोगे जो भी है मैं तुम्हें दे दूंगा अगर नहीं भी मांगोगे मेरा इनकार भी कर दोगे फिर भी सब कुछ तुझे दे दूंगा मैं मैं तो सिर्फ ये चाहता हूं कि तुम मेरी तरफ पलट के आ जाओ वापस पूरी कायनात तुम्हारी है सुलेमान ने दुनिया की मिल्कियत और मुल्क मांगा खुदा ने एक आन में दे दिया खुदा के लिए कौन सी बड़ी बात है सब कुछ दे दे खुदा लेकिन खुदा हमसे कहता है कि मुझसे मुझे को मांगो कौन वो बदबक्त है कि जिसको बादशाह और शहनशाह कहे कि मुझसे सब कुछ मांग लो और वो इतफा कर ले एक झोंपड़ी पर कौन ऐसा अहमक होगा जिस तरह हम हैं 
خدا کہتا ہے وہ دو نہیں استجب لکوم ذرا مجھے یہ بتائیے کہ اگر خدا کی مخلوق حاصل کرنے میں اتنا مزہ ہے تو خدا کو حاصل کرنے میں کتنا مزہ ہوگا یہ پوری کائنات ایک ہلکی سی جھلک ہے خدا کے حسن کی جسے خدا مل گیا کیا مزہ اس نے چکھا ذرا یہ بتائیے کہ حسین سے اکبر چھینے عباس چھن گئے اسگر کا گلا چھد گیا اس کے بعد بھی لبوں پر مسکراہٹ ہے کیسی لذت محسوس کر رہے تھے حسین یہاں پر کس کا استقبال ہو رہا تھا خود حسین کے قلب متحر میں اور وہ داستان موسا کو ذرا یاد کریں کہ جب کوئی زندیک نبی موسا کو ملتا ہے اور کہتا ہے موسا اگر تمہارے خدا کا یہ دعویٰ ہے کہ وہی کھلاتا ہے پلاتا ہے اور سانس لینے کے لیے ہوا دیتا ہے تو تمہارے خدا سے کہہ دو کہ سب کچھ چھین لے مجھ سے میں تمہارے خدا پر ایمان نہیں لے آتا موسا جب ہم کلام ہوئے خدا سے تو خدا نے کہا اے موسا میری طرف سے جواب دینا اسے پہلے تو یہ کہنا کہ تمہارے پروردگار نے تم کو سلام کہا ہے اس کے بعد یہ کہنا کہ تو بندہ ہو کر بندگی سے رو گردانی کر سکتا ہے میں خدا ہو کر خدا ہی نہیں چھوڑ سکتا چاہ چاہے تو میرا اعتراف کر یا نہ کر جب تک میں تم کو زندہ رکھوں گا تب تک کھلاتا پلاتا رہوں گا خدا کہتا ہے تم اگر نہیں بھی مانگو گے پھر بھی میں سب کچھ تجھے دے دوں گا انکار بھی کرو گے میرے وجود کا پھر بھی میں سب کچھ تجھے دے دوں گا میں تو صرف ایک بات چاہتا ہوں تجھ سے کہ تو سمجھ لے کہ یہاں پر ایک راز مخفی ہے مجھے پکار کر اس راز کو آشکار کر لے تمہارے لیے سب سے بڑا انعام یہاں پر ہے اس انعام کو اپنا لو لیکن اس انعام کو اپنا لینے میں ایک بہت بڑی بڑا کام کرنے کی ضرورت ہے اور وہ یہ ہے کہ خود کو خدا میں مٹا دے اللہ اکبر واقعی جسے خدا مل گیا پھر اسے کیا چاہیے آپ دیکھیں ہمارے آئمہ نے کتنے پیارے انداز سے ہمیں سمجھایا ہے ایران میں میں تھا ماہ مبارک میں ان دنوں میں جب تعلیم حاصل کر رہا تھا آیت اللہ جوادی عمولی تھے غالباً جنہوں نے یہ تقریر کی تھی دعائے جوشن کبیر کے فقرات پر فقرات پر یا طبیب من لا طبیب لا جب امام پکارتے ہیں اور خدا سے کہتے ہیں کہ اے طبیب اس کا کہ جس کا کوئی طبیب نہیں اب آغا نے فرمایا کہ ہماری سمجھ میں اور آئمہ کی سمجھ میں بے حد فرق ہے ہم جب یہ فکرے پڑھتے ہیں تو ہماری دماغ میں یہ بات آتی ہے کہ جب باقی اطبا جواب دے دیں دنیا والے تو پھر مسجد کی طرف رخ مڑتا ہے ہمارا اور خدا کے حضور میں حاضر ہوتے ہیں اور خدا سے کہتے ہیں اے طبیب جس کا کوئی طبیب نہیں کیونکہ باقی دنیا جواب دے چکی اب تیرے علاوہ میرا کوئی آسرا نہیں لیکن کہتے ہیں کہ نہیں آئمہ کی منطق الگ ہے آئمہ کہتے ہیں کہ اے طبیب جو ایسا طبیب ہے کہ کوئی اور طبیب ہے ہی نہیں چاہے جہاں سے بھی دوا آئے تو ہی طبیب ہے اصل میں آئمہ کی سمجھ الگ تھی ہماری سمجھ الگ ہے اور پھر کبھی آسمان کی طرف جھانک کر دیکھے کتنی بڑی اور وسیع کائنات ہے جو اس کائنات کا پالن ہار ہے پورے کائنات کو پال رہا ہے اللہ اکبر کتنا وہ خدا مہان ہے کتنا بزرگ ہے جو کیڑوں کو اپنی غذا دیتا ہے اور رزق دیتا ہے جو کائنات کا رزاق ہے خلاق ہے مالک ہے کیا وہ خدا میرے لیے کافی نہیں ہے ذرا کو یہ سمجھ لے اگر خدا سے وہ رشتہ جوڑ لے انسان تو اس قدر اندر سے آزاد ہو جاتا ہے کہ اپنے مقصد کی طرف بہت جلدی پھر پہنچنے لگ جاتا ہے تو سب سے پہلا پہلا اصول یہ ہے کہ دعا ایک شعوری رشتہ قائم کرنے کا نام ہے جب کبھی دعا کریں ہم تو حاضر ہو کے دعا کریں کہ خدا سے مانگ رہے ہیں رٹی ہوئے طور پر دعا نہ مانگے اب دیکھیں رجب میں یہ دعا ہے حرم شیبتی النار امام صادق سلام اللہ علیہ اور اس وقت انشاءاللہ بعد میں بات کریں گے تفصیلاً امام صادق 
की उम्र थी साठ या साठ से ऊपर उन दिनों में और आपकी रीश है अकदस सफेद हो चुकी थी तो आप अपनी रीश को पकड़कर उंगली से इशारा करते हुए कहते थे हर रिम शेब थी अलनार मेरी इस सफेद दाढ़ी को आग पर हराम कर दे अब आजकल हम वही दुआ पढ़ते हैं अब वो शख्स कि जिसकी रीश काली है दाढ़ी काली है वो काली दाढ़ी को पकड़ के कहते हैं हरिम शेब थी अलनार अब ये क्या हो रहा है तुम्हारी दाढ़ी सफेद नहीं है तो क्यों कह रहे हो कि मेरी सफेद दाढ़ी को आराम कर दे और फिर हम में से बाज ऐसे भी हैं जिसकी दाढ़ी नहीं है बेचारों की तो वो किसी और की दाढ़ी पकड़ कर कहे उसकी दाढ़ी को हराम कर दे और फिर खवातिन की दाढ़ी होनी भी नहीं चाहिए तब वो क्या करें कहें कि मेरे शोहर की दाढ़ी को आराम कर दे बात यह है कि हमने दुआ को समझा ही नहीं एक राज है एक रिश्ता है अब और अल्लाह के दरमियान और डायरेक्ट रिश्ता है कि जिसमें न जिब्राइल आते हैं न कुरान भी आता है ऐसा डायरेक्ट रिश्ता है मुस्तकीम बरा रास्त रिश्ता है मेरा खुदा के साथ मेरा खुदा है इसलिए अलीब ने अभी तालीब दुआ को मिल कहते हैं या रबी या रबी या रब अल्लाह के नाम से नहीं पुकारते कहते हैं ए मेरे परवर दिगार जब मैं पढ़ता हूं तो ये मेरा परवर दिगार है जिसे मैं पुकार रहा हूं ना अलीब ने अभी तालीब का अली का खुदा तो अली का खुदा है कायनात का खुदा मेरा खुदा एक बहुत मामूली सा खुदा है ये एक पर्सनल शख्सी इनफिरादी और यूनिक रिश्ता है हर एक का खुदा के साथ और खुदा जो सबको पाल रहा है अल्लाह अकबर जो हुसैन के साथ थे हुसैन के सहाबी हर एक मुख्तलिफ था हुसैन रबुल आलमीन की इबादत में थे लेकिन दूसरे जो थे रोज आशूरा हमें यह बयानात मिलते हैं मकातिल से कि हुसैन के लबों पर मुस्कुराहट थी अब्बास के मुंह से चेहरे से नूर फूट रहा था अकबर शाद थे जब दूसरों ने देखा तो कहा देखो इन लोगों को इनके चेहरों पर बिल्कुल डर नहीं खौफ नहीं नंगी तलवारें खड़ी हैं इनके सामने और ये हुसैन के साहब ही थे हुसैन का साहब थे हुसैन मुस्कुराते हुए देखते हैं सहाबियों की तरफ कहते हैं मौत एक पुल है खुदा की तरफ जाने का क्यों डर है मौत से हम हर एक का एक इनफिरादी रिश्ता था अपने खुदा के साथ और आप देखें किस तरह से हुसैन का रिश्ता गहरा है खुदा के साथ हुसैन मक्के आए हैं अपनी हज को उमरा में तब्दील करते हैं जब मक्के से खरूज करने लगते हैं तो दो शख्स के साथ मुलाकात होती है जिसमें जरा हुसैन की मंतिक भी समझे हम सलाम एक अब्दुल्ला इबन उमर हुसैन से कहते हैं हुसैन इराक की तरफ ना बढ़ी है इमाम हुसैन देखते हैं अब्दुल्ला इबन उमर की तरफ कहते हैं कि अब्दुल्ला अगर तुम्हारे वालिद उमर यहाँ होते आज तो उसी तरह तलवार को नियाम से निकाल कर मेरे सपोर्ट में खड़े रहते हैं जिस तरह रसूल खुदा को सपोर्ट किया था अगर तुम मेरे साथ नहीं आ सकते तो मदीना वापस चले जाओ और लोगों से बताओ क्या बे इंसाफी हो रही है फिर इब्ने अब्बास आए इब्ने अब्बास आए इमाम हुसैन के पास इब्ने अब्बास ने नसीहत करना चाहा जैनब ने देखा हसास मौका है तो जैनब आकर दरवाजे के पीछे खड़ी हो गई इब्ने अब्बास ने कहा हुसैन मदीना वापस चले जाए इराक का सफर इख्तियार ना करे इमाम ने कहा इब्ने अब्बास मैं नहीं चाहता कि मदीने की हरमती को पामाल करें मेरे खून से ये लोग मेरे पास चारा ही नहीं कि मैं इराक की तरफ बढ़ू का ए हुसैन आखिर कहीं और चले जा सकते हैं आप इराक की तरफ क्यों जाना चाहते हैं तो इमाम हुसैन ने कहा इन अल्लाह यूरीद यारानी कतीला इब्न अब्बास अल्लाह मुझे मकतूल देखना चाहता है का ए हुसैन अगर यही बात है तो जैन अब और कुलसूम को क्यों साथ ले जा रहे हो तो कहा इन अल्लाह यूरीद यारा सबाया अल्लाह इन्हें कैदी देखना चाहता है तो फिर बच्चों को क्यों लेना ले जा रहे हो अल्लाह देखना चाहता है इन्हें सहरा में बिखरा हुआ जब इमाम हुसैन ने यह जवाब दिया तो जैनब से रहा न गया कहा इब्ने अब्बास इंसाफ करो क्या जैनब हुसैन के बगैर रह सकती है जिंदा आपकी ये जरूरत ने आपने ये सवाल कर लिया हुसैन से 
ویسے زینب کے دل میں تشویش تھی ڈر تھا کہ کہیں حسین ابن عباس کی بات نہ مان لے اور کہہ نہ دے کہ زینب کو اپنے ساتھ مدینہ واپس لے جاؤ ایک آن بھی حسین سے منفصل ہونا نہیں چاہتی تھی یہ بہنا کس قدر محبت ہے حسین سے حسین آگے بڑھ رہے ہیں ایک ایسا موقع آتا ہے کہ جب کوفا سے ہوا آتی ہے تو حسین اپنی سواری پر رک جاتے ہیں کوفا کی طرف رخ کرتے ہیں اور اسی وقت کیا ہو رہا ہے کہ مسلم کو دار العمارہ کی چھت پر لے آیا ہے مسلم نے رخ کیا ہے مکہ کا اور کہتے ہیں السلام علیکہ یا ابا عبداللہ مسلم کا سلام گونجتا ہوا آ رہا ہے مسلم نے بس سلام کہا اور تلوار نیچے آئی نازل ہوئی مسلم کا سر تن سے جدا ہوا سر زمین کے طرف آ رہا ہے کہ حسین کھڑے ہو جاتے ہیں کہتے ہیں وعلیک السلام یا مسلم آپ پر بھی میرا سلام ہو اے مسلم حسین گوڑے سے زمین پر آتے ہیں ٹھیرتے ہیں تھوڑی دیر اور کہتے ہیں مسلم کی بیٹیوں کو میرے پاس لے آؤ مسلم کی بیٹیاں جب آئیں تو حسین نے گود میں بٹھایا سر پر سے جب ہاتھ پھیرنے لگے ہیں تو بچیاں تڑپی اور کہا مامو جان ہمارے بابا کی تو خیر ہے حسین نے کہا اگر آپ کے بابا نہیں رہے تو ہم تو ہیں ابھی بھی جب یہ بات اور شور ہوا کہ مسلم کی بیٹیاں یتیم ہو گئیں تو سکینہ کو خیال آیا کہ یتیم کسے کہتے ہیں پوچھنے لگی ہے اممہ یتیم کا کیا مطلب ہوتا ہے میں کہوں گا ذرا آئی آشور کے دن اور وہ منظر دیکھے کس قدر نادان بچی دانا ہو گئی ہے زلجنہ آگے بڑھنے سے انکار کر رہے ہیں اے زلجنہ آخری جنگ ہے لے جاؤ اپنے آقا کو اور میدان جنگ تک پہنچا دو گوڑے نے سر جکایا سر سے آنسو ٹپکے نیچے سے نازک سے آواز بلند ہوئی ہے بابا میری آخری وسیعت پوری کرتے جاؤ سکینہ کیا چاہتی ہو زمین پر آ کر میرے پاس بیٹھو حسین بیٹھتے ہیں سکینہ کہیے اے بابا اپنی گود میں مجھے بٹھاؤ جب گود میں بٹھایا کہا کہ اے بابا میرے سر پر سے ویسے ہاتھ پھیرو جیسے یتیموں کے سر پر سے ہاتھ پھیرتے ہیں اللہ لعنت اللہ للقوم الظالمین وسیعلم الذین ظلموا یہ منقلبی ینقلبون ماتم حسین Okay.